Penny, thank you so much. Dr. Lehrer, welcome to the panel. We're so glad that you're here. Um, you know, we, we're going to start this conversation, um, you know, with uh, really more about what you're doing today in this role, learning more about Longevity Health Plan and the fact that, you know, you are a Medicare Advantage ISNP or an Institutional Special Needs Plan. So, Renee, what makes these Medicare Advantage plans unique? So, thanks. And hi, Kate. And Annie, thanks very much for our kind intro. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, first off, what is an ISNIP? An Institutional Special Needs Plan is one of three SNPs. There's DSNP, CSNP, and ISNIP. ISNIP was a pilot program that was approved several years ago by Congress to be in place because it was identified as having material impact on improving quality of care for institutionalized patients and also improving cost of care. So in an ISNIP, we only enroll patients who are in institutional settings, who are there long-term, meaning there is no discharge plan. They are likely, although not required, to spend the rest of their lives in an institution. They have Part A and Part B Medicare, uh, and they basically um, aren't going anywhere. Our average age probably is 85 to 90 years old. Average life expectancy is somewhere in the three-year range. Um, highly comorbid, many, many comorbid conditions. We have 25, 30% of our members who have more than 12 different diagnoses with an equal number of meds. So it's a very unique population that is really in a position that are probably some of the most vulnerable. Almost all of them are in um, a dual ISNIP program meaning they're both Medicare and Medicaid eligible and on Medicare and Medicaid. The ISNIP is only the Medicare portion of that. So those are the members that we take care of. Today, we, as longevity, we are only in skilled nursing facilities. At this point, we are not in ALF or ILF. We're only taking those people that are in nursing homes where we believe we can work closest with them on a skilling in place and a treat-in-place methodology. So, Renee, let's talk about a, a little bit more then about your actual business model as it stands today. You said you're in SNFs exclusively. I, you have a really interesting relationship, though, with these skilled nursing providers. So they're not a network per se. You've described it to me that they're actually part owners of this Medicare Advantage plan. Can you elaborate on this? So our model is pretty much a provider-owned plan. So we are now in seven states. Uh, with about 3,500 members, which for an ISNIP is a pretty good size. It puts us in the top three or four. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. We work in partnership with the larger SNF owners in the communities that we're in. So generally, when we say we're provider-owned, providers typically own half the plan, and our investors own the other half the plan. So they typically are very engaged in the operational aspects, the quality aspects of the program and are supported through different reimbursement mechanisms from capitation to gain share to quality programs and so on. So they're really meant to be partners. We are 100% transparent. So every owner, every building knows exactly what the premium is. They know exactly what the ref score is for each member. They know what every expense is. So there is no margin in this business for us unless there is for our owners and the building operators. So we're equal partners. There is no black box. There's nothing behind the scenes. There's no markups. We are truly, tr totally transparent and work very closely with them. That's pretty unique in this industry. There are really three kinds of ISNIPs. There are those that are owned by national players, national, big national insurers. There's a lot of behind the scenes in those, obviously. There are those that are owned by some of the people who own the nursing homes and have their own ISNIP for their own buildings. And we are what we call an independent ISNIP in that that is our only business. We do not own nursing homes. We are not a national player. We, we are a national player, but we don't have multiple products. We only do ISNIP. So obviously, in times like COVID, that was a challenge for us where we didn't have other products to back us where the other products were highly successful, and we were obviously challenged with high utilization. 
and high medical costs. So it's a very different relationship. And as a result, the owners like it because they know what's going on and there are no games. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you to remind us what year did you launch Longevity? How long has it been in market before COVID hit? So we started in two states in two, January of 2019. All new Medicare plans start in January. And we started in the New York City, and again, it's by county. So it's New York metro area, New York, Long Island, and Westchester, and in Chicago in 19, 2019. And then in 2020, we went live as well in New Jersey and Florida. In March of 2020, obviously the beginning of COVID hit New York really hard. Uh, the management of the nursing homes weren't quite ready for this kind of pandemic. Nobody really was. As many as over 30% of our members in New York City passed away. And then we saw the rise across the country. It sort of was in a wave. Different states came at different times. Uh, and then we saw it come down. So we had significant losses of membership, unfortunately, due to them passing away. Or some of them, if they could, got out of the nursing homes. Also, there were very few new admissions to nursing homes. People were afraid of nursing homes. They were afraid of COVID. And so if there was any opportunity to stay in the community, members stayed in the community. But again, remember, in our population, probably less than 40% are competent to make their own decisions because of age and mental health status. Um, so that the reality is more than 60% have either a responsible party or a family member who make decisions on their behalf. Renee, when did you start to, you know, it, so knowing you, as long as I have, I've also known you from a, a prior role. Um, you know, you, you helped to navigate on the payer side, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. You've seen a lot. This might be the first pandemic you've ever had to lead a business through. When did you start to see that, you know, that the, the your numbers get back to where you hoped to be. And, and we're going to then go to, to talk about how you actually deliver the care in the skilled nursing facility. But tell us, you know, when did you start to see, you know, you're now, as you said, in the top three or four ISNPs nationally. <laughs> what time, you know, when were you able to recover from that dramatic drop off at the start of the pandemic and, and really start to get traction in the market? So, you know, everyone sort of remembers where they were the day something happened. You always have that memory. We know exactly when things changed, and it was really like March 10th, 11th, 12th of 2020. That's when we began seeing it. We began to see huge cases in New York. We began to see um, ambulances that wouldn't pick up patients, hospitals that wouldn't accept patients, patients dying in nursing homes because there was no care. That really went on for about a year. Started in New York, then we saw it big time in Illinois, we had, at that point, we were in Florida and in North Carolina. We saw every state come up with new rules. In Florida, for example, even if a patient was positive but asymptomatic, the state mandated that they go to a hospital. In fact, in Florida, the Department of Health went to the nursing homes and called the ambulances themselves, even though the patients perhaps didn't need to go clinically. On the other side, in New York, we saw COVID-positive patients discharged from hospitals back into nursing homes, which then just caused a spread. I would say we started, started to see it level off probably a year later. And we were doing well through March, April, May. We started enrolling members again, and then Delta came. So we, we're now really in our third major wave with Omicron. We started growing. We probably hit our lowest membership, less than half of, we were to, of where we are today, probably last May or June. From that period on, we started growing. Plus, the government put in place something called an 1135 waiver. The waiver allowed nursing homes to skill patients, meaning put them on a Part A skilled day without a preceding hospital stay. Prior to the waiver, you had to have been hospitalized for three days before you could be skilled. Government put that in place to avoid big rushes of this population at the hospital to keep hospital beds open. But it had lots of impact. It allowed nursing homes to skill patients without being in the hospital. And so that had a big impact on enrollment. The nursing homes were getting paid much more in the fee-for-service world, so they were slowing enrollment down. Uh, we've seen that 
pretty much go away. And now with Omicron come back again. But what we're seeing is another challenge, a major challenge, which is staffing in nursing homes. So what we're finding is there are almost no staff on certain shifts. We've had buildings of two and 300 members where there is no clinician in the building for a, for a shift, sometimes more than one shift. Our model is every patient is assigned an NP and every building is assigned an NP. And what we're finding now is very often our nurse practitioner is the only clinician in the building at certain times. They may be the ones actually passing around the meds in the med cart, there's nobody else there. They're helping feed patients, they're helping starting IVs, they're doing phlebotomy. They're doing everything that the building needs to do, but is not staffed to do it. So what we have found is many times we are the only clinical person there and we're providing service to everyone. So the combination of the waiver, which is incenting buildings to keep patients in FIFA service because of reimbursement and the lack of staff, it's again sort of been a bit of a challenge for us. Uh, but we're still growing. In fact, January was our biggest month. We had the most growth we've ever seen because I think buildings are realizing there's a value here. The big change for buildings in this model is moving to value-based. That, that's a new concept. And I came more from the managed care world and I'd go into buildings and talk about PMPM and admits per thousand and they had no idea what I was talking about had never heard those terms before. They talked about PPD, which I had no idea what that meant. So we had to get translators. And really the interesting challenge has been for the nursing homes to move from, what can I get on a FIFA service world by providing services to how do I take care of this patient holistically and then benefit from the value that I create? It's a major change from nursing homes. And it's a change that I think is aggressively coming and one that the payers besides us will d demand. And so I think those buildings that are a bit more visionary are moving a bit more quickly into this space, but given that we'll be 50% MA, it's gonna happen. And I think if folks can adjust and educate and incent, they'll be in a much better place. You know, Renee, I'm, knowing that there, we, first of all, we have a lot of SNFs in our audience um, and we have so many um, post-acute care providers that, again, are, are learning to make this transition to a value-based care economy. I really want to give you a few more minutes to, to address that. But before we do, you know, in prior conversations, you've told me, you know, the success of your business and you stated today, too, is that transparency. Everyone knows what's happening. Um, and one of the things that you told me you did, um, your organization at Longevity, is you actually built a system <laughs> that um, patient claims data, care plans, star quality information was all in one place. Can you describe what went into yeah, so, that and, and so, why did you go there? So first, the issue was a clinical platform. There really was no EMR or clinical platform that was built for an ISA. Most of them were built for community-based care. And in an ISNIP, there is a detailed model of care that must be submitted and scored by CMS in order to get your contract with CMS, which outlines in detail what you must do for a patient, how often you see them, how you assess them, what you do for advanced care planning, how you interact with the PCP. And so when you track that, when you manage that, you have to have a system that follows the flow that the clinician needs to do to make sure that he or she collects that information. It didn't exist. So the first thing we did was we built our own platform to say, let's build this with the help of the nurse practitioners who are in the buildings to make sure it follows their needs and that they understand when someone needs to be seen and how they need to be seen and how they document and how they capture codes and how they follow up and how they risk adjust and how they do advanced care planning. It's critical, otherwise things get left out. So the combination of a tickling or calendar system, as well as very detailed clinical support is critically important. So you have that as one set of data. Then you have claims, which is obviously paid separately in a claim system. And then you have the building, the nursing homes, um, medical record as well. And what we built and finalizing building is a data warehouse that captures all of that. So we can begin to do predictive modeling. Again, most of our patients are custodial patients. 
but given their age, at some point, many of them get ill, and we need to be able to identify what are the characteristics of that patient that make them more likely or less likely to have an event. In other words, predictive modeling, so that we can then direct the NPs, go see Mrs. Jones a bit more frequently, or we've seen a change in her or his behavior in terms of they're not getting bed, out of bed as much, they're not uh, eating as much, they're not speaking as much. Those are early indicators of a problem. Our goal is not to treat patients when they have an issue. Our goal is to treat patients longitudinally and as much as possible avoid an issue and to keep them in the nursing home and not put them in the hospital. There is nothing good about putting a 90-year-old in the hospital. If they have to go, they have to go. But right now, we think there's probably half the admissions are probably can be avoided with appropriate good clinical care in advance and treatment in the building. And so our whole philosophy, philosophy is to treat in place, keep people where they live. Very different than a community-based program. The difference we have is we know where every patient is every day. Having run very large MA plans, most of the time we had no idea where anyone was. We didn't know who their doctor was. We couldn't find them. There's a unique opportunity here. We know who they are. We know where they are. We know what medical problems they have. We know who their doctors are, and we can see them every day. Totally different world. I can only imagine how, how you are expanding treatment of this very frail elderly population. And, and as you're building this data model, Renee, I, I just, I, I anticipate the application of this is gonna be even beyond longevity. You know, I, I wonder if you're gonna be able to, you know, as you said, intercept these, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know de degrading condition and, and that sort of thing. Tangent, but um, <laughs> you also said one thing that, uh, before we get to our last question, I want to have a chance for you to really um, explain your philosophy that you bring to your leadership position, which is you can do well and do good for business. So you can do well, or is it do good for the patient, do well for the business. Tell me how that plays out here in this longevity model. You know, it's very interesting. There's always a debate about managed care forever, that it's all about saving money. It's not about clinical, and you just don't want to pay for that CAT scan, or patient needs care, you're just denying care. I, I don't agree with that, but there's always been that debate. There is no debate in this population. Sending this population to the hospital is generally bad care unless they have no other choice but to go. Clearly, if someone's having an acute event or an acute procedure or an acute MI or a stroke, they probably need to go. But the most common reasons for people to go to nursing, to go to hospitals and nursing homes are falls, which should be avoided. Um, it's infection, which should be identified early. So if we can take care of people without sending them to the hospital, you send a 90-year-old to the hospital, there's a reasonable likelihood there's going to be a mistake. Someone's going to make a mistake. Someone's going to get the wrong med. Someone's going to get the wrong treatment. We all know when you're in the hospital how many people come in and out of that room all day long. If you're at all confused, you're just going to get even worse and more confused and just totally discombobulated. And when they come back to the home, it takes a long time for them to adjust. So there is no debate like there is in managed care about keeping people where they are and taking care of them as long as possible and as best as possible in their home setting, which is the nursing home. So that's the example was you're doing the right thing clinically. When we look at ISNIP, we, we, it's an insurance entity and a payer, obviously, but our core skill is clinically managing seniors in institutional settings with our NPs. A vehicle to do that is through insurance taking risk. There are lots of ways to do that. More than two thirds of our staff are clinicians. Um, they're NPs, they're in buildings. We have well over a hundred NPs in our buildings. They're the ones that drive this business. Obviously there's a financial component, but the clinicians are the face of the company. They're the face to the member, they're the face to the family, they're the face to their, whoever the, you know, the parties are that have responsibility. We are first and foremost a clinical company that has a financial basis to it. And our goal, which is why we take care of patients who aren't our members, is to just do the right thing and keep people at the highest level of functioning they can in a place they are the most comfortable in. 
you know, Renee, as you, um, and, and amen to that, <laughs> um, you, you have described the, the transformation that you've been able to bring about as you partner with these skilled nursing operators, that you have taught them that it is not okay to just send, you know, whereas before it was almost the default, send the individual, send the resident to hospital. Now you're training them of the value of keeping them where they are. Do you think that this, especially as this sector has become so much more scrutinized during the pandemic, the, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a big PR problem for them to overcome. Do you feel that this is maybe the future trend for where skilled nursing will be? Will they begin to accept more of ownership of, of how that care is delivered? Do you see that happening? I think they have no choice. First off, the other thing that is happening at this point is the level of severity of illness in skilled nursing homes is going up. Patients who are in skilled nursing homes today, 10 years ago would have been hospitalized. And my guess is five years from now or whatever time period, the level of severity of patients in nursing homes will go up. People don't want to be in nursing homes if they don't have to be, if they have the financial wherewithal and the capability. So those, they won't, the nursing homes won't go away. There is always going to be a population that needs the level of care that can't be provided in the community. And so we see that getting, these patients getting sicker more patients on dialysis, more patients on vents, just generally sicker patients. And I think the government and also the right thing will be for the nursing homes to not just be buildings where they take care of people, but buildings where they take care of people holistically and get paid for being doing the right thing for members, which is taking care of them, not sending them to hospital when they don't need to go, but incent the right behavior, which is really what value-based care is about. Absolutely, which is why I would love for you, again, in the, the closing moments of, of our time together, again, our, our audience is predominantly post-acute care providers. So as you've mentioned, you know, Medicare Advantage is really penetrating this market. Value-based care is, is going to become kind of the, the dominant form of reimbursement. What advice do you have from your perspective for our audience today as they prepare for a value-based care economy? You know, I think in, if I think many of the skilled nursing facilities learned a lot during COVID. It's about taking care of the patient holistically. It's about understanding who's seeing the patient, who's in, who is coming in from a physician perspective, who's doing labs. Unfortunately, there are providers out there who take advantage of this population and provide services in excess. The buildings need to be much more aware of what does this patient need, not just is the bed full and how much therapy they need, but do they need to go to the hospital? Do they need all these specialists seeing them? Are they taking the right meds? And really take a very holistic approach to the patient. And almost in many cases, they function like a PCP. They determine often when a patient goes to the hospital, often not the doctor. They determine which specialist they're going to see, often when they're going to see the, see the specialist. They determine if someone's going to need an ambulance. When you think about it, they're there all the time. The staff in that nursing home really makes decisions about patients. We now have to create the right incentives and, more importantly, the right education for the staff in that building to think about the overview of the patient in all the care they deliver. And that's new. It's a new thought. It's not generally how they've thought about things. And I think when they do that, not only will that improve patient care, but it will dramatically improve relationships between buildings and pairs. Absolutely. Well, so much to absorb and think through. Um, but thank you so much today, uh, Dr. Renee Lehrer, for really, really giving everyone such a very granular but meaningful overview of an ISNIP plan, yours in particular, um, and every success to you um, as you care for more of these frail elderly people. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Kate. Appreciate it. You take care. All right, you too.